All right, so like I said, I'm going to go through the first little bit of the DML stuff, which is uh, the DDL stuff, which is the data definition language. Before the break, I discussed about how the SQL language is broken down into three pieces, the, the, DDL, the DDL, the DML, and the DCL. The data definition language builds your house, the DML populates your house, and the DCL is the security guard at the front door who determines who can go in what part of your house. Now, that's, this demonstration is going to be one part DDL and a little bit of DML. This is the, this, the section that will basically, the next 10, 15 minutes will cover everything you need for lab six. If you've already done lab six, congratulations. Um, then after that, I'm going to cover the start of the DML, with, which is selecting records. I just tried to get clever and pull my chair over with my foot and I almost fell on my ass. Hot damn. Okay. Now, the primary part of the DDL is creating things. And the command you use is called create. Now, as always, as I've discussed in the SQL language, there's a bunch of different people that seem to have worked on this and never actually agreed to what things should have been called or how they should have been done. Why, I don't know. That's just how it was done. However, some of it is somewhat similar. There's the create table command. If you want to create a view, it'd be called create view. If you want to create a function, it's create function. I think you're starting to see a pattern here. You want to create a, def uh, a user defined data type, create data type, I think it is. Off the top of my head, I don't remember. But that's what the command is, is create table. Now, when you create something, you have to give it a name. I'm going to call this one example. Create table example. I'm going to open up a bracket. I'm going to close the bracket right away. Why? Because that's just a good habit. Now, what do you put in here? In here, you put in your definition for your fields. If you're thinking back about the design stage of the things, that would have been your attributes. And your fields are made up of two things plus some extras depending. What are those two things? It has a name because everything has a name. ID. What's the next thing you'd feed it? A data type. Since it's going to be our primary key, we're going to make this a big serial. And since it's also going to be our primary key, I'm going to use this, the original primary key syntax. Now, there's two syntaxes for primary keys. There's the way I'm about to show you, which is known as the short form. And then there's the long form, which is actually adding an extra line at the end of the create table called constraint. I like this form because that's what I learned. I'll just be honest. Whenever I go to create a table, this is the one I remember. The other one I actually have to look up. And you'll see why I like this one better. There we go. It's a primary key. The other format is there's a line at the bottom. It's constraint. Then you have to give it a name. Then you have to do some definitions on what the field's called and stuff like that. It's actually a bit of a pain. There is one advantage to each approach. If you do it this way, I say two advantages to this method. One, it's immediately obvious which one's the primary key at a glance. Number two, it actually automatically names your constraint for you. The advantage of the other way is you get to pick the name of your constraint. But the name of the constraint has to be unique to the database. Which means if you've got a really big database with like 100 fields in it, it might be rough. Uh, this sucks. Okay, well, we sort of got a recording. Half of my recording took. Good news is my voice took. So it'll be a blank screen on the other side. Great. So the primary key, that's how you define it. Now, as you'll notice, there's a comma at the end here, because each field you put in needs to be defined with, and has to be separated. Now, I'm going to put in a field called name. Although you may notice it turned blue, because name is supposedly a, a reserved keyword in Postgres, I've never actually seen it actually do anything. So name is okay. And this is going to be... Character varying 50, 
and it's not null. What does not null mean? That which means it's required. So when you think back at your design stage and you talked about this field is required, this field's not required, if it's required, it means it's not null. Now, I'm going to add one more field to this. I'm going to call it active. It's going to be a Boolean. If I can actually type in the word Boolean. So we got an active field called active. It's a Boolean. And I'm going to set the default to true. Therefore, I'm showing you every little piece that you can, how you can alter this. And you can actually put the default here if you want. You could make this not null. There's actually a few other things you can do in here, but these are the most common ones you'd use. And then, once you're done, you hit the Go button. Now, you will notice that there's no comma here. Why? On the last field, there's never a comma. I'm going to put a comma here, and I'm going to change the name of my table so it doesn't complain about that. And I hit the Run button. All right. I'm doing this on purpose to show you guys an error message. Unfortunately, it's really, really, really tiny. Not a lot I can do about that. Um, why is it really tiny? Um, because that's just what the editor does. But what it's saying here is syntax error near bracket. So normally when you see that kind of error message when you're typing in SQL, it means that whatever is wrong there, hap the, the mistake's actually just before it. Which means there it is. Now, I'm going to show you guys a different error message. And those of you that we're in my labs, I've probably heard me say this to some of the other people when they get this error message. Relation example already exists. Now, I actually took count. I kept track. Some of you might not have realized. I was keeping track of how many people came to me and asked me, what does that mean that example already exists? Fourteen people asked me that question. And then I said out loud, read it out loud. And what does that say? They say, well, it says it already exists. And then I look at them. I say, think about that a little bit for a second. And they're like, what does that mean? I'm not making fun of you, the, guy, the 14 of you that approached me, by the way. I'm just highlighting it for the other two groups that haven't had this lab yet. It already exists. Well, you're trying to create something and it tells you it's already exists. it already exists. Therefore, what does that tell you? It tells me that I already made it. Therefore, can you make some, the same thing twice? No. It's like, can you build a house on the same foundation twice while the house is already there? No. There you go. That's the short and long of it. It cannot, you cannot create an object with the same name twice unless you'd get rid of the original object first. And that's basically all you need to know roughly about creating tables. There is one other piece of syntax, and actually I forgot to cover it with my Monday guys. I'm going to create a table called example2. It's going to have all the same fields. However, I'm going to add one, one, one more field. I'm going to call it example ID. And it's a uh, int8 because it's a big serial. And it's the keyword references. Uh, References is another shortcut. This is how I learned it in college also. And why do I like using this syntax? Because it's better than the constraint syntax, although the constraint syntax has more flexibility. You can, it allows you to set more rules. This accepts whatever the default rules are for the database, and usually that's a safe bet anyways. References means you cannot add a value into that field unless it already exists in another table. In other words, example ID cannot receive a value unless it exists in the ID column of the examples table. And that's what it does. So this, you can input whatever values you want in here as long as those values already exist in this table in this field. So that's what the references does. And ta-da. I'm going to hit run. And my query worked. Because I'm awesome. Now, 
That's the create table syntax. I literally have covered 80% of the create table syntax with you guys right there. If you want to know the last 20, you know that 80-20 rule, right? I can actually cover 80% of the create table syntax in 10 minutes, and then it would take me two lectures to cover the rest. There's so much syntax. But this 80% covers so much that, honestly, I don't think, and I've been doing working with databases for over 20 years, I don't think I've ever used anything outside the set that you see on the screen now. That last 20% is for edge cases and weird stuff. Cool. So the next statement is, we created a couple of tables, and now we need to change them, because, you know, somewhere along the way the plan changed. I'm going to run a quick select statement. I'm going to be talking about select in detail for the next three weeks. So I'm not going to explain what it does yet. But I did a select statement. You can see right here, ID, name, and active. Congratulations. We have three fields or three columns in our table as defined. Now I want to add a new column to this because, you know, somebody decided they needed to. Alter table example. I'm going to, what does that think? What do you think that's going to do? I'm changing the table. I'm altering the table. I'm going to add a column. And by the way, the word column here is optional. You can just go add. I prefer using add column because you could go add constraint. Add, there's about a three or four other things you can add. So I like being explicit with my SQL statements. Why? Because not all SQL interpreters are as forgiving. Therefore, assume the lowest common denominator and whatever SQL editor you're using or SQL interpreter you're working with is really, really dumb. Therefore, if you assume it's done and you're going to give it explicit instructions, its odds are going to work better because you're giving it the full set of rules. Anybody here ever tell their friend or significant other or insignificant other, can you just this? And you don't really tell them what you want it done. You just kind of say, can you get me a drink? And they come back with a Budweiser, piss in a bottle. And you don't drink alcohol at all. And all you wanted was a glass of water. Why? Because you were not explicit in your instructions. Assume that the SQL interpreter is going to be just as dumb as that. So you're going to add a column. And I'm going to call this one email. And it's going to be a varkar 50. Now some of you have noticed I've used character varying. Character varying and varkar are the same thing. Varkar is the shortcut. And I'm going to add a semicolon. And I'm going to, I'm actually going to go, just so you can see right away that this happened. I'm going to hit run. If I actually click on the right window. Now you can see email's been added right here. Yay for us. We have stuff. I'm going to add a second email column, just because I can. And there's our second email column. Pretty fantastic. That was fast. Not too painful. Now let's just say we know we made a mistake and email 2 wasn't supposed to go in. We can get rid of it. Drop column. And if you do this, email 2 goes away. Now, there's all kinds of other things you can do the columns when you use the alter statement. I'm not going to go into detail in the recording because unfortunately most SQL interpreters have their own little hang-ups on this. MySQL does it one way, Postgres does it one way, Oracle does it a different way, and Microsoft SQL Server does whatever the heck it wants to do. Most of the time the right answer with them is right-click edit with Microsoft SQL Server. Why? Because they like you to point and click. So what else can you do with the alter statement? You can change the data type, you can rename the field, you can set the default, you can draw, remove the default value. Um, there's all kinds of odds and ends you can do. You, can, you cannot add a references at this point. Once you've created a field, you cannot make it, make it refer to another one. Then you have to add a constraint, just so you know. Okay, so now I've shown you how to create a table, how to change the table, 
Before I show you how to delete a table, I'm going to put some stuff in the table and play with that. So I'm stepping away from DDL, I'm stepping into DML now. So I'm going to do insert statements. All right, here's the basic layout for an, is an insert statement. You insert into what the hell you're going to stick it into, then you tell it what you're going to stick into it, then you stick it in it. That's basically what's going to happen. So insert into, then you give it the name of the table. In the case, since we're playing with example, we're going to insert into example. Then you have to tell it what columns you're going to feed to it, or what fields you're going to populate. I'm going to populate name and email. And over here, like such. And you'll see right here, two columns, two values. I'm going to hit run if I click on the right window. Congratulations, one row affected. Now I'm going to show you a few error messages you may experience. Why? It's better that you see them here. I'm inserting it to example. I defined name, but I gave it two values. I'm going to hit run. Insert has more expressions than target columns. That's it saying, dude, you gave me one spot. You're giving me two things to do in one hole. It doesn't work that way. Then I know why you smirked, and that's not what I meant. That's wrong. Dude. Now I got that vision in my mind. Thanks. But essentially what's happening is you're giving two pieces of data and you're telling it, put those two pieces of data in one place and it's something you can't do. Uh, the other, the alternative to this, if I switch it and I do this instead, you'll get the opposite error message, which is, insert has more target columns and expressions. Now you're saying I've got two slots to put stuff in, which are only giving one, be one thing to put into it. I'm going to run with this now. Thanks. So, now I'm going to select from this table because I did actually succeed to put something in there. And, as you can see, I populated name and email, but you notice active got populated with true. Because when I defined this table originally, I set the default to true. So, and the other thing you might not have realized, you see the ID also got a value. Why did ID get a value? Because ID has a default value also. You didn't define it. But you told it to have a default value and you told it to be a big serial. Because big serial is a 98 with a default value of the next possible value. Therefore, I specified two columns, gave it two columns worth of data, and it populated all four columns. It's like magic. So I'm going to add a couple more pieces in here. of terrible email addresses. I'm going to go run. Oh, forgot to close my quote. That's another error message you might see. Unterminated quote. That means you did. You were dumb and you did like I did. You forgot to close your quote. Run, run. All right. That should be enough. And go. Hey, I've got 19 rows. Hot damn. This is great. So, the next statement, now I've shown you insert, and you have seen, I've shown you the variations of insert. There's actually one more version of insert, but I don't teach it because it's used in specific edge cases. It's not something you do every day. If you want to know the alternative way of doing it, that kind of an insert, come and see me when we have time at the end, and I'll show you. Not the end of today, at the end of you know those two weeks where I don't know what to do with you guys. I can do demonstrations and stuff like that then. Okay. So that's that one. The next statement is update. And as I've described to some of you, the SQL language, I swear to God, was designed by 20 different people sitting in 20 different rooms and they weren't allowed to talk to each other. Why? Because none of the syntax looks the same. If it all looked the same, this would be fantastic. And for once, MySQL tried to be clever and it tried to make all the syntax look the same. So they actually have an insert statement that looks just like an update statement, but nobody else uses it. So everybody just laughs at MySQL being, oh, you're the special child that likes, you know, unicorns that, that shit rainbows. 
because you're trying to make things that nobody else is ever going to use. So the syntax for updating a table is update. Notice you don't see the word table anywhere. It's update the name of the table. Then you're going to set a value. And you can set more than one value at once, but I'll set one value. So I'm going to make it pull it back right away so you see the results instantly. I'm going to do update example, set active to false, because if you can see right now, right here, in row with ID number one, it's set to true. And I'm going to hit run, maybe. And now you see, oh God, one's gone. One has died. No, I didn't. It's at the bottom. And this is one of the weird quirks of Postgres. It's because Postgres doesn't hide from you what it's actually doing. Other database servers like MySQL and Microsoft SQL Server and all them, they lie about what they're doing. What Postgres does is if you change a row, what it does, it takes the, the existing row, rewrites it at the end of the table with the new values applied, and then reaches up and marks the old row as being dead. That was really bad of me. And it marks the old row as dead. So then when you retrieve from everything, it'll just show that it went to the bottom instead of being at the top. Other database servers, what they do is they go row one. Great. We'll write it to the end. We're going to go back to row one. We'll mark it as deleted. And then we're going to say database server, row one is still at the beginning of the table. Show it that way. It literally takes that and then copies it back up to the top. It actually does an in, a forced insertion. And forced insertions add overhead. So their writes are actually slower than Postgres's, just so you know. So that's what the update does. It moved it to the bottom here. Since I'm pointing at my screen, you can't even see what I'm pointing at, but it moved it to the bottom. It's nothing to panic about. It's OK. Now I'm going to modify this again. And I'm going to change the name to, uh, whoops, like such. And I'm going to hit run. And now, again, it's at the end. But now you can see the name changed to, oops, I changed two columns this time instead of one. And that's OK. That's how it works. No more complicated than this. No more easy than this. Now. This where thing at the end, I'm going to be talking about this in detail through the next couple of weeks. Because this actually applies to everything. If I were to go and do this instead, anybody want to take a guess what's going to happen? Just shout it, dude. Yeah. Basically, you're telling it, do it to everything. If you don't say it, I want to be exclusionary and I only want to talk to this little special club, my little click over here, everybody gets it. And it's kind of dangerous when you do that because, you know, it's kind of dangerous. Now, the cool thing is, is this editor has gotten clever and most of you won't, wouldn't be able to do this unless you turn off certain features. Uh, I don't know if I actually turned it off in this or not. Obviously, I didn't. Actually, I turned it off, the, the safety, which is Postgres, th this particular editor allows you to not, doesn't allow you to run a global command without some sort of where clause. But it's important to be able to do it too, so I turn it off by default because sometimes I do this at work. So I managed to nuke the entire set of data. Now it all looks like this. So the last statement I want to show you guys uh, yeah, greater, no, that's less than. Like this. Delete from. You'll notice there's nothing here. Some database interpreters want you to do this. Why? I have no idea. Delete from the table name and you give it the clause. So I'm going to run it. Boom. I'm now only five rows left. Why? Because I told it everything greater than five in this ID. So one to five is here. And if I were to do this, what happens? 
Yeah, pretty much. You, everything's gone. This is one way of emptying out a table, yes. No, it's not. Now, dropping the table, you'll see in a minute. Dropping the table means you set the house on fire and you burnt it to the ground. If you do a delete without a where clause, you basically took everybody out back and shot them, but you still get to keep your house. Using, you know, graphic examples. Now, there's a big difference. There's one other command that's similar to this, and it's called truncate. What truncate does is it will nuke the contents of the table instantly. What it does is it takes the definition of the table, depending on the interpreter, mind you, that depending on the server, they do them all a little bit differently, but they all do essentially this. They take the definition of the table, create a new version of this table, and then make the other one go away. Essentially, if you, if you did a delete from a table and it has like 10 million rows, it's going to take it a couple of minutes. Why? Because it'll do row one, delete, row two, delete, row three, delete. It goes through them one at a time. Truncate looks at it and goes, <coughs> everything's gone. So, I'm going to do a truncate example. And as somebody said on my Tuesday lecture, that's the easiest command I've seen yet. It's not a command you use all the time. Why? Because you'd be destroying data constantly. It has its purpose in life, but it's not an everyday type of command. And I'm going to run it. Now, I get an error message that the guys on Monday didn't see, because I didn't do the other example of references with them. You'll see, cannot truncate a table reference in, with a foreign key constraint. This allows you to avoid wiping out an entire family tree. Because if you were allowed to truncate a table, and, there's t and it's being referred to by other ones, it would kill all the children and all the grandchildren and on and on, all the way down the bottom until there's nothing left in your database below the point you're working at. So I can't truncate example yet. So I'm going to get rid of the table that refers to it since I want to talk about dropping a table, since you mentioned dropping a table. Dropping a table allows you to basically bulldoze your house flat. Brand new pad. You can start a brand new construction in that spot. And some unknown reason. Really? No. Bluetooth. Okay, I just dropped the table. Did you notice how fast that was? That could have been full of a million rows. It would have taken the same amount of time. So I'm going to go back to my truncate. Boop, gone. That could have been a million rows. It might have taken 30, 32, 33 milliseconds to get rid of a million rows. A delete would have taken minutes. Ta-da. And then I'm going to get rid of this table. Like such. Table gone. And I run that. Table does not exist because I just deleted it. I just gave you guys the 20 minute tour of DDL. Uh, this 20 minute tour, maybe half an hour, would cover 90% of what you ever need to do with DDL, just so you know. So, in a one half hour lecture, I just showed you 90% of what you need to know how to create tables and add data and delete data and update data. Pretty cool, eh? And you have a reference of it on video by tomorrow, which is going to be special because I'm going to have to cut out a section uh, where I made an oops. And we'll move on from there. Now, now for the today's slideshow. Because there's actually a slideshow. Yeah, week 5 and 6, sort of. It's like week 5, 6, 11, whatever this is. Apparently it's week seven. I don't know where that math came in, but apparently it's week seven of education. Um, somehow we're pretending five weeks never happened. We've got to keep, you know, certain employees happy that they're not working those extra weeks. So it's week seven. I avoided certain labels on that statement because you're not allowed to label people in this day and age. Okay. We are, I'm going to cover very 
Not a whole lot after this, uh, from this point going forward. Why? Uh, because I, like I said, I want to keep both groups in sync. So I caught you where you guys just caught up to where the other guys on Monday were. But this first part took 45 minutes for them instead of 25. Okay. Where we are going to spend pretty much the rest of our term is on the select statement. The select statement is used to retrieve records from a database. Congratulations. You've always seen me run a command called select star from example. That's a select statement. Why is it called select? It's because you're telling the database interpreter to go select some records for you and give them to you so you can look at them. Of course, it's read-only. Therefore, it's like going to the library where they show you the pages through a glass window, but that's okay. It reaches into the database and gives you what you're asking for. There you go. It is very, very flexible. It can do a lot of stuff. And I used to have a line in here, and I don't know why I took it out, because I probably offended someone. But it's a very English language. In other words, if you can, because, you know, some people have problems with reading and writing sentences, therefore, they might have been, that might have been the problem. It reads and writes like an English sentence. Weird syntax for an English sentence, but it is like an English sentence. If you can read it out loud and it makes sense, it's going to do exactly what you told it to do. Notice I'm being specific about my words. It's going to do exactly what you told it to do. Not necessarily what you want it to do, but it's going to do exactly what you told it to do. It's a bit like if you pop your clutch and slam your car into reverse instead of first because you weren't paying attention when your transmission is now sitting on the ground behind your car. It did exactly what you told it to do, not what you wanted it to do. It's a very forgiving language, and most of the error messages are fairly obvious, and it's straightforward. Now, it's made up out of two, three, four, five, six pieces. And why I say it's made out of that many pieces is that you can use, at minimum, two pieces, and you can add on the other pieces as needed, which is kind of nifty. Today, I'm going to focus on, actually, this says focus on the first three parts. I'm actually going to focus on the first, well, I'm going to do the start the, the third part today. The basic three parts of a select statement is yeah, there's a list of fields you're going to retrieve, there's a list of tables you're going to retrieve, and then there's a list of conditionals. Now, I realize you guys had a break, and you know, since this is being recorded, I'm not going to discuss about how long the break was, but you guys had a little break, and thanks to this little break, um, you may not remember some of the stuff you might have learned in your Java class. Uh, do you guys remember vaguely learning about conditionals? An if statement? Boolean logic? You know? True, false. Are things true, false? Because in database land, when you're filtering records, everything comes down to true or false. Is this statement true or is it not? If it's true, give it to me. If it's false, I don't want to see it sort of like when you work in a, in a company and the boss says, did we make money this month? Yes, show me the profit report. No, I don't want to see it. Why? Because there's no profit report. <laughs> so better off not seeing it. That's the conditionals list. So in the field list, since it started at the beginning, like we should, there are two options. There is the star, also known as the asterisk. It means grab all available columns. It means it's going to grab absolutely everything it needs. Or you could define a set number of columns. There's pros and cons to both of these. If you do a select star, you don't have to guess as to what columns are being returned because you get them all. You don't have to guess at the structure. You get all the columns back. If you are specific, that means you're retrieving less data. Now, some of you may go, well, what's the difference? Okay, allow me to demonstrate. I'm just going to close this for a second. Click on this.
Okay, I just switched to the ThinkCube database. You guys all have this database, by the way. If you did Lab 1, you have this database. Uh, if your laptop shit the bed over the last five weeks, because you're, I don't know, did something to your laptop in the last five weeks, you may not have ThinkCube database, and you have to redo Lab 1. Congratulations. Because you will not be able to do Labs 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 without ThinkCube. So, it's kind of important you can make sure you have this. Now, and of course i got to make the font bigger again. Okay, now what you need to pay attention to is down here. I'm going to hit the run button. 1.1 seconds. So I just told it retrieve every call, every piece of available information inside the customer's table. Which, you know, is actually what I was supposed to talk to you about next before I went to this slide, but I decided to preemptively take care of that. So I'm telling it, grab all columns from customers. So select all columns from customers. Does that sound like an English sentence? Sounds like an English sentence. It's doing exactly what I told it to do. It took 1.1 seconds, just so you can see it, and I'll move out of the way the guys on the other side. 1.1 seconds to retrieve 10,000 and change rows. Let's just say all I want is their name and their email. I'm asking for less information. Three hundred seventy nine milliseconds. I still retrieved ten thousand rows and change. Now to explain to you what's happening, in most server environments, often the database server is not sitting on the same server that serves up your web app or your application or the middle tier or whatever you want to call it. It's sitting somewhere at the end of a pipe. Now what happens, for example, when you take a bath, for those of you that take baths, and you hit the button or you pop the plug, does the water disappear instantly? Why? Because the hole is that big and there's that much to go through it. Therefore, event, it's slowly got to trickle through that tiny little pipe to exit the tub. Same deal here. You just asked it to transmit a gig of data. Let's say there's a million rows and it's a gigabyte's worth of text. You want to transmit that gigabyte of text from the database server to the middle tier. And the pipe's that big. How long is it going to take to transmit that gigabyte of text down that pipe? It's going to take a while. What's happening while everything's transmitting through that pipe? Everybody else has to wait. It's just like, you know, when you go to certain places and they have one door and it's really narrow, right? And everybody's got to wait their turn to go through the door. And once in a while, somebody's a little bit larger gets stuck in the door. And you've got to wait for that guy to finish being pushed through. And then the next guy can go through. If you do a select star, it's like that, you know, slightly larger guy. I'm, not, I'm only picking on the guys. Slightly larger individual. Has to be shoved through that narrow door. And eventually he pops out the other side. And then everybody else can go through. That's what select star does. If you go select name and email, for example, that means you're reducing the amount of data you're retrieving significantly. And therefore... It goes through the narrow door really, really fast because there's less of it to go through the door. Boop, boop, the other side it goes. And then the other guy can go poop, 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 and it's pretty quick. That's why you want to select specific fields. It's tempting to always use the star, but you've got to take into account eventually it's actually going to start costing you. It's just not a good habit. It's a good tool if you don't know what the table structure looks like. Therefore, you use the select star to see what's inside the table, see what the data, the data looks like, and then you start getting specific after that. Why? Because that's how you should do it. All right. Back to PowerPoint. Was that, was that pretty a clear example of why you don't want to use star all the time? Not very PC example, but you know. So then we have the table list. And there's three types of table lists. There's a single table, which you've seen me do on the screen already. Select star from customers. I'm selecting from a single table. It's the easiest one. There's joins, which I'm going to cover in about a lecture and a half to two lectures from now, depending on how next week goes. Then there's something called derived tables. Ditto. I'm not covering that for at least two lectures, just so you know. 
The example at the bottom is from test, what you guys have already seen from customers and from example. Which leads me to conditionals. It is often known as the where clause. So often when you hear me talk to you about your conditionals, you'll say, I'll say, what's in your where clause? Do you have a where clause? Do you know what a where clause is? Were you awake during my lecture when I was sarcastic making fun of you because you don't know what a where clause is? Preemptively making fun of you, I should say. I'm not making fun of you now, but you know, preemptively I might make fun of you because you weren't paying attention to me. Because you were busy doing this and busy answering phones and whatever. I'm busy doing this or busy playing Doki Doki Literature Club and feeling freaked out. You know, there's all kinds of things. It's known as the where clause. And it is a series of Boolean expressions. And by now, hopefully you understand what I talk about when I talk about a Boolean expression. It's an expression that resolves to true or false. It has, you have a bunch of different operators you can use, and I'll be talking about those in just a slide. There, you can have multiple clauses, which actually I'm going to talk about that next week, uh, just so I keep all the groups in sync. And then there's the brackets business, which goes hand in hand with the multiple clauses. Multiple clauses mean you can have more than one rule applied. So far today, I'm just going to show you about one rule. Why? Because keep it simple on the first day of this stuff back. I mean, at least 90% of you haven't used your brains in five weeks. <laughs> you laugh. How many of you actually tried to do their labs in the last five weeks? Hot damn, I was pretty good on my 90%. I was actually closer to... Uh, 65 to 70 percent. Actually, I got more hands than I expected. But I'm just using that as an example. I'm sure, but at least you tried. I'm <laughs> sure. Knock yourself out. Um, send it to me and I'll spread it out. Um, so I'm going to talk about the standard comparison operators. Some of these you may have seen in your Java class. If you haven't seen them, well, you're seeing them here for the first time. There's a, no, the basic set, which is very C-like. C-like languages mean it's a language that's based on C. This is C, C++, Objective-C, Java, PHP, C-sharp. You can see a pattern here, right? Pretty much everybody uses these. And they fall into categories of less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And there's also just greater than, which I seem to be missing in there. And not equal to. Not equal to looks a little weird, but some of you have probably seen it in Java class, I hope, by now. Right? Exclamation mark, equal sign. Not equal to. The equality check is a single equal sign. This is where the Java students trip up because they go, equality is equal, equal, equal. Or if you've ever used PHP, it's equal, equal, equal. Actually, PHP uses equal, equal, and triple equal also, but they actually serve different purposes. One is, is it equivalent to? The other one is, is it identical to? It sounds like the same thing, but it's not. In SQL, equality is equal. Is A equal to B? A is never equal to B because they're two different letters. But is A equal to B? Thus, it's a single equal sign. The language was designed to be used by managers. They had high hopes. But it was designed to be used by managers. Not equal can be written in two different ways. There's the modern way, which is the exclamation mark equal sign. We got that one about 10 years ago. Before that, we had diamond operator. Greater than, less than. It looks like a little diamond, just like on a deck of cards. Because is it possible for something to be larger than and less than something else at the same time? No. Therefore, if it can't be larger and it can't be smaller, therefore it's not equal to this either. Therefore, that's what they came up with. If it's not, if it's like this, it's the same thing as that. Okay, we have a few other special comparison operators. There's in. In is fantastic. In is in like a list. So, for example, here I wrote in ID is in. Well, there, I don't have the word is. But ID in, and I feed it a list of values. So in this case, I'll say give me all the rows where the ID is equal to 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6. 
It won't return three. It won't return anything bigger than six. It won't return anything less than one. Why? Because you said, give me everything inside this list. So theoretically, it should return five rows. If any of those rows don't exist, it only return the matching ones in this list. There is a between command. ID between one and four. It is an inclusive check. If you use the between command, it means that it includes one, two, three, and four. There is no exclusive between. But if you wonder what that means, it means no. It's between one and four, but don't include one and four, so it would give you two and three. There are ways to write that, but there is no easy shortcut to that one. There's the word is, which is usually used to check for a null or for a boolean. Because, can something be equal to null? No, null, nothing's ever equal to null. There's no such thing. You can't go null equal null because neither side exists. Nulls are absence of, of value. It's vacuum. There's a space, but there's nothing inside. I'm sure you all have a friend like that. Hollow. You can't say, is this hollow the same as that hollow? Because hollow has no meaning. Therefore, they, the SQL guys came up to the conclusion of, hey, well, actually, what we used to have to write is, for example, if you're dealing with a Boolean, which can be null, you could say, is it not true? Is it not, and is it not false? Then it must be null, right? You go by process of elimination. If it's not true and it's not false, it must be null, unless you deal with MySQL, which has uh, zero to nine versions of yes and no, because it doesn't have a true Boolean. So in MySQL, you go, is it one? Is it two? Is it three? Is it four? Is it five? Is it six, seven, eight, nine? No, okay, it's none of these. Okay, it must be null. Congratulations. So somebody got clever and they said, they create a command called is null. So you can say, give me all the records where email, email is null. Then others will give you all the records of customers that never had an email defined. Nice and simple. And it sounds like English. At the same time, you can do the same check with the Boolean. You can actually go active if, act well, where active equals true. However, realistically, you should be using the is keyword where active is true or active is false. Why? Syntactically, it makes a little more sense. It's a little cleaner, a little nicer. Then there's not. Not's the modifier. Not negates the list that's above there. So, not in. That means it'll give you everything but what's in that list. So, if you go not in 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6, it'll give you 0, 3, and everything bigger than 6. But 1, 2, 4, 5, and 6 will not be included for the ride. Because you said, give me everything but this. It's like you send out an email and you say, send it to all my friends except that guy. Because you don't want to include them. Not between 1 and 4. That doesn't mean it's going to give you 2 and 3. It's going to give you everything but 1, 2, 3, and 4. Everything less. Everything bigger. And then there's is not null. In other words, has there ever been a value shoved into this field? Yes. Hot damn. Is not null. Now I'm going to do some examples. Because I'm going to stop at this slide today. And I'm going to do a couple of examples for you guys. And then next week we start with pattern matching. <laughs> oh, good times. Okay. I've already done select name and email from customers. I'm going to go back to using select star. Because, you know, I'm kind of cool that way. Again, 1.1 seconds. And we can see, like, I wish I'd stop pointing at the screen. We can see that we have all kinds of things we can play with here. We've got a bunch of IDs and we've got some addresses and some postal codes and some email addresses. Now, okay, select star from customers where ID is equal to two. I'm asking, this is the most basic SQL statement you can get. A little. 
But however, if you're trying to target, you're on a web page and you're loading one record, you don't want to load a million records to display two. Okay. That means that the odds are, you know, you're, you're on a website and you hit edit my profile. What the database is going to do, actually this is the difference between COBOL, for example, and modern database. What COBOL will do is you go, go edit this customer record. What it'll actually do is it'll actually load the form, loop through all the records until it finds the one you want, it wants, and then display it to you. What SQL will do is say, go where the ID is number two. It looks up inside its index, says, where's two? Oh, two's over here. Grab. And gives it to you. It doesn't go through all the records. It grabs after the one you're after specifically. That means there's a lot less data processing happening in front of it. So select star from customers where ID is equal to two. I want to retrieve a single record. There's one record. If I'm working with a string, I put it in single quote marks. Some of you have already experienced double quotes. Postgres is double quote hell. Because Postgres uses double quotes for a special purpose. It has special meaning to Postgres, double quotes, instead of single quotes. Now, single quotes are universal. They'll work in all database servers. Double quotes don't work everywhere. They don't work in Postgres. They don't work in Teradata. And they don't work in, there's one more I'm forgetting. Um, it starts with a P. I don't know, it's whatever it's called. Double quotes don't work. In, actually, double quotes also don't work in SAP DB, just so you know. Why? Because SAP DB is actually Postgres. That's been rebranded re because that's what SAP does. Um, so don't use double. If you're going to go after a specific spot, so I'm going to go look where... Like that, I'm just going to search for a string. This is very specific. Where the name is equal to that. Here's the other kicker for you guys. Strings are case sensitive. If I did all lowercase, they would not match. Just so you know. Why? Because that's how Postgres is. MySQL, on the other hand, says, Dude, I got your back. I'll give you everything case insensitive. Now, the problem with MySQL is, because everything is case insensitive, how do you find the ones where they're only lowercase because you want to fix the typos? Guess what you can't do? You can't search for lowercase a because they'll give you lowercase a and uppercase a every single time because that's MySQL. That's why we use Postgres for this course. So we can get you into the good habits right off the bat. So I'm going to run this and it should look exactly the same. Congratulations. I was able to type. There is Amin Mounet in Bremerhaven, whatever the hell that is. But there's our one record. That's how we match on a single value. Now I'm going to go ID is between 1 and 5. Now you'll notice I only retrieved four records. Why? Because there is no ID 1 in this database. The first row was deleted. And when you guys do your assignment too, please remember this moment. Hint. If you aren't paying attention because you're playing video games like he is right now. I know that clicking. He won't remember that I said remember the fact that there's no ID 1. It plays in, into account for the assignment. It's hinting. So that's how between works. If I were going to go, say, in 2, 3, 6, uh, 5, 7, 100, like this, and apparently I can't type in the word N. Here's my five rows. That's how in works. It goes in this list. Now, if I were to include one in this, which I will, just for, you know, demonstration purposes, like such, and go. You'll see that I still only have five rows because, as I said earlier, I don't have a row where there's an ID of one. It doesn't give you an error. It just goes, well then, I can't find this. That's okay. That's just how it works. It's like trying to find the door handle in Lotus at least. There isn't one. Because they decided door handles weren't cool. And that's how the in clause work. If I were to do the not, 
So I'm going to do the inverse of this. Okay, fine. That's going to take 1.1 seconds because I'm going to retrieve 10,095 rows because I'm excluding five rows. There's your basic SQL statement for your everybody's enjoyment. Um, that is enough to kickstart you into lab seven. You've seen enough to do lab six. And theoretically, you should be able to do lab five if you have all your tools in place. And next week's lecture will get you more than well off on your way to be able to do lab seven. Therefore, yay. Um, and we're going to keep rolling slowly through this.